Yeah. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio, or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6 a.m. Hope you can join us. On radio, they call it the drive time slot, 4 p.m. until 6 p.m. as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify, and we try to make sense of it for you. Frasier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubri, and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events, and I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates, some strong opinions, and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubri, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. And welcome to On The Money, where we're focused on the UK's cost of living crisis, helping you beat the squeeze. I'm Liam Halligan, and for the next hour, we'll be talking about those pesky price rises again, not least for food and fuel, which are disproportionately hitting the poor. What's the best way for Chancellor Rishi Sunak to help the UK's most vulnerable households? We host a detailed discussion. Plus, blindness is often seen as a barrier to landing your dream but we meet one lad from Merseyside who didn't let visual impairment stop him becoming an international footballer. All that and more are on the money after the GB News headlines with Rhiannon Jones. Thank you, Liam. Good afternoon. It's coming up to one minute past one. Your top stories from the GB Newsroom. Boris Johnson has been told that he faces no further action and won't receive a second fine for breaching COVID laws, Number 10 has confirmed. The Met Police has concluded its investigation into alleged breaches of regulations at Downing Street and Whitehall. In total, 126 referrals have been made for fixed penalty notices for breaches of lockdown rules during the pandemic. In a statement, the Met Police said 83 individuals received fines, 28 uh, received between two and five referrals. The Chancellor's under mounting pressure from businesses, charities and MPs to produce a package of support after inflation hit a 40-year high. There are calls for a windfall tax on oil and gas companies that have benefited from high global prices. Rishi Sunak said in a speech last night that the government's prepared to help families cope with rising inflation. That as the Treasury is under increasing pressure to bring benefit and pension rises forward to help those struggling with the cost of living. Labour leader Sakir Starmer says he wants the government to do more. People are really struggling with their bills. Inflation's up, prices are up, wages are down, and the government is imposing tax on them at the same time. And he's got no answers. Um, and he had the opportunity. One of the answers is staring the Prime Minister in the face, a windfall tax to reduce bills by up to £600 for those that most need it on the profits that oil and gas companies didn't need, uh, didn't expect to make. I think the Prime Minister will U-turn on this, um, but the, by the time he's done that, so many people will have struggled with their bills for so much longer. The United Nations is warning that Russia's invasion of Ukraine could soon cause a global food crisis that may last for years. The UN Secretary General says the situation could lead to tens of millions of people facing food insecurity and famine. Russia and Ukraine account for nearly a third of global wheat supplies. The wars led to soaring global prices. Antonio Guterres has appealed to Moscow to allow the safe export of grain stored in Ukrainian ports. Russia says that if it opens access, it would expect the removal of some sanctions imposed by the West. 
Meanwhile, Moscow claims that over 750 more Ukrainian fighters have surrendered in the Russian-held port city of Mariupol. Negotiations have been ongoing between the two sides to evacuate soldiers held up in the Azovstal steelworks. According to Russia, it brings the total number of Ukrainian fighters to leave the plant since Monday to 1,730. It's unknown how many remain. Ukrainian officials have declined to comment on the fate of the soldiers. And more than 50,000 refugees have arrived in the UK after fleeing the war in Ukraine. Official figures show that almost 54,000 people came over under the Family and Homes for Ukraine sponsorship schemes. Around 128,000 applied for visas, but just over half of those who've been issued with one have arrived. The government failed in its duty of care to doctors during the coronavirus pandemic. That's according to the British Medical Association. Its own review into the government's handling of the crisis highlights the lack of personal protective equipment in the early stages. It found that more than four in five doctors said they didn't feel adequately protected during the first wave of the virus. Royal Mail says it will need to increase its prices and cut costs by more than £350 million amid rising inflation. The firm says it faces higher wage demands and steeper energy and fuel costs. Royal Mail insists no further job losses are planned. That's after announcing in January that 700 managerial positions would go. NHS England says checks for prostate cancer have hit an all-time high. Urgent referrals for urological cancers reached a record level in March, with more than 24,000 men checked. Around 550,000 people checked their risk of developing the disease online during the six weeks of an awareness campaign. Archaeologists in England have a new mystery to solve. They've just unearthed a rare stone circle at a prehistoric ritual site in Cornwall. Aerial photos show a long-buried structure resembling a crooked horseshoe, but the meaning behind it is still unclear. And the UK's biggest ever lottery winners have been revealed. Joe and Jess Thwaite won a record-breaking £184 million jackpot. Yes, £184 million on a lucky dip ticket. The Gloucester couple, who've been married for 11 years, say they now have time to dream. No doubt they do. This is GB News. We'll bring you more as it happens now, though. Let's return to Liam with On The Money. And coming up on The Money today, as the cost of living squeeze tightens with prices rising at their fastest pace for 40 years, what is the best way for Chancellor Rishi Sunak to help the most vulnerable households? Higher taxes? Lower taxes? Direct payments to the poorest? We host a detailed discussion. Plus, visual impairment can be a barrier to employment, or at least limit your options. But does it? We meet the guide dogs for the Blind Association, and a blind footballer with his guide dog. It's a truly inspiring story of determination and sporting excellence. And the Queen's speech revealed the government's planning a new rental reform bill. In particular, measures to end so-called no-fault evictions. What would that mean for both tenants and landlords going forward? Again, we examine the detail. Plus, from renting houses to renting cars. Today's in-depth money talks interview is with Tim Vetters, managing director at one of the UK's largest car rental companies, Sixth UK. He'll be telling us why people are turning away from car ownership and looking to rentals to save cash as the cost of living squeeze bites. And as ever, I want your questions, opinions, ideas. What do you think of the issues raised in today's On The Money and what do they mean to you? Email gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet at gbnews. I'll read out some of your messages later in the show, so stay with us, because this is GB News. I'm Liam Halligan, and you're on the money. Now, the last time inflation was this high, Shakin Stevens was in the charts, <laughs> and Bucks Fizz was storming the Eurovision Song Contest, telling us it was time to make our mind up. Inflation did indeed hit 9% in April, the highest since the early 80s. Back then, Britain was at war in the Falklands. Rishi Sunak was two years old.
When the Chancellor delivered his spring statement in March, the cost of living was already spiralling. Sunak was then criticised for failing to do more to help hard-pressed families, a view he tried to counter last night when talking to the Confederation of British Industry. Our role in government is to help cut costs for families. I cannot pretend that this will be easy. As I told the House of Commons yesterday, there is no measure that any government could take, no law we could pass that can make these global forces disappear overnight. The next few months will be tough. Just weeks ago, Chancellor Rishi Sunak was touted as the next Tory leader. Now he's under huge pressure to both cut taxes and find more money <coughs> for measures to tackle rising inequality as the cost of living squeeze bites. Figures released this week showed that average wages rose 7% in January to March this year compared to the same three-month period in 2021. But that figure includes it bonuses, not least in the financial sector. Exclude them and average wages were up just 4.2%, far less than 9% inflation. Among the richest 1% of households, wages rose more than 11%, more than inflation, protecting living standards. But the poorest tenth of the population saw their wages rise less than 1%. That amounts to a huge post-inflation fall in living standards, given rising prices in the shops. These numbers do predate the April rise in the minimum wage from 8 91 to £9.50 an hour, which will help lower-income workers. But the business leaders Sunak addressed last night, they'd point out they're footing most of the bill for that increase in the minimum wage, while arguing that if the Chancellor actually cut taxes, shoring up fragile-looking financial markets and bolstering economic growth, then it'd generate more tax revenues to help those lower-income households. And that's the uh, on-the-money question today. The Chancellor's complex conundrum. What is the best way for Rishi Sunak to help the most vulnerable? As ever here on The Money, grown-up conversations with people who really know this, their stuff. And today, I'm delighted to welcome back to the show Helen Barnard. She is Associate Director at the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, a campaigning charity working to inspire social change through research, a very important part of our national debate. Neil Sharlick runs Gillingham Street Angels, a food bank in Kent. Good to see you here again, Neil. And Jasmine Bertles in the studio, MissMoneyMagpie.com herself. Great to have you with us. Helen, you appear quite often on The Money. We're always pleased to see you with us. Since you last appeared, there really is a growing sense now that the cost of living squeeze is escalating. The position of the lower income households, the most vulnerable, is getting worse, but no additional help from the Chancellor. Surely that needs to change. Yes, of course it does. I think the moment the government keeps saying they are stand ready to help, I think but they never quite seem to step forward and actually help. Now, I think pressure is mounting. I think it's interesting to see how many Conservative MPs are now saying completely openly, we need to get money to people at the very bottom. We need to use the benefit system to do that. I think the question is, will the Chancellor finally listen to that and step in? Or will he keep trying to kick the can down the road because he's worried it's going to get even worse? Neil, let's turn to you. Again, good to have you back from Gillingham Street Angels. How's the situation where you are? And what are your views in terms of what the Chancellor should be doing to get the most bang for his buck, if you like, to put the money where it's needed most to be used most effectively? I think the money needs to come directly to the charities that are supporting people. I think if you're trying to rise higher taxes to get some money to give back to the people that you're making pay higher taxes, you're just going around in a, in a circle. That's not the way to do it. They need to tax the right kind of people, get the money from people who can afford this to hand me down. I don't think this is the benefit system it isn't just the answer. We found originally that we were helping people that were unemployed, people that are homeless. Now that's people in full-time employment coming to our services, people they just can't afford to make ends meet. And I think we're going to end up in some crazy situations where people are going to start doing very silly things to help to help. I think people are going to start using fires, candles, dangerous measures to keep themselves fed, to keep themselves warm. I think we're going to put ourselves into a dangerous situation. 
Jasmine, I called it a complex conundrum at the top of the show. He's being told to raise taxes by some people. He's being told to lower taxes by some other people. Meanwhile, the Bank of England's calling itself helpless to tackle rising inflation. You're rolling your yes, eyes yes, um, <laughs> for people listening on radio. And as we speak, financial markets are looking pretty shaky. Mm, absolutely. I mean, I'm rolling my eyes because, to be frank, I think that this situation has been created by our central bank, the Bank of England, printing too much money and by the government having lockdown, you know, because essentially th this situation has been created by lockdown, not just in this country, but, but in other parts of the, parts of the world. We've, we've stopped production, we've dampened production of both products and services. We've massively increased the amount of money supply, hence inflation. But what does he do now? What's yeah. the best way that should he maybe restore that £20 uplift to universal credit? Maybe mm. increasing and broadening eligibility for the warm homes allowance? Yeah. Maybe making sure it happens through the summer because, of course, energy bills are high even though... The central heating isn't as on, on as often as it ordinarily is. Yes, I think possibly, you know, some or all of the above. I, I mean, I do think that we, we are now in a situation... I, I, I mean, having said that, I, I blame the Central Bank, the Bank of England. I do think they are now in a cleft stick, self-created, but it is difficult. I think they do need to increase... Um, interest rates far more. I mean, it, they're sort of edging them up. I think we need to have much more. As you know, back in the 70s, 80s, it was 20% interest to rates. To squeeze that inflation out of the system because yes, inflation when... sounds like a nebulous concept and pe until people actually realise what it means yes. for the poor. Yes. They get worse hammered by inflation. Exactly. A lot of wealthy people make money out of inflation because <laughs> they've got they assets. Yes, but I think what would help um, certainly is to increase, so, so make the, the money flow even tighter, but but um, have sort of fiscal, fiscally have, have um, you know... Government more, spending, yeah. Yeah, spending, but also bring down taxes. So I do think perhaps if we raised again the... Um, the basic rate of income tax. At the moment, it's 12750 I think. So The threshold. Yeah, the threshold. Take more people that. out of tax. I think so, because, as we've heard, much of the time it is people in Working work. people yes. who were yes. previously... Pretty well off, Absolutely. quite comfortable, yes. as we just heard so, from Neil Sharlick down there yeah. in Gillingham. Yeah. Gillingham, not a particularly, you know, <laughs> poor. poor part of the country in the south yes. pretty near exactly. to the capital. Yeah. Helen, let's go back to you. What's the Joseph... I mean, Joseph Rowntree, I, I, I said it at the top, I, I mean it, very, very important voice in our national debate for many, many years. What's your main policy pitch now to Rishi Sunak? So the main thing he needs to do really quickly is just at least raise benefits to cover the rising cost of living. I mean, it, you know, it feels like it should be blindingly obvious, to be honest, that when inflation is this high, actively cutting the incomes of the people at the very bottom is going to be incredibly damaging. And that needs to happen fast. This isn't a let's wait till autumn thing. This is a let's do it right now thing. I think there are also kind of slightly longer term things he could do. So it was interesting, Neil was talking about people in work uh, now also facing hardship. It was disappointing to see they've dropped the employment bill from the Queen's speech, which could have been a long-term measure to improve the quality of jobs and give people more protection. So there's things like that. But right now, I mean, we're already hearing people are trying to cook baked beans over a candle. You know, this is just an appalling level of hardship. And we do need to step in quickly. And the benefit system is the most cost-effective, efficient way to get money to people that we already know need it. Neil Sharlick down there in Gillingham, as Helen Barnard just pointed out, benefits were only raised 3.1% in Rishi Sunak's spring statement, so that's the level they're going to stay at for the next year from April to April, at a time when inflation is now 9%. It's set to go higher. On the other hand, the minimum wage went up in April. I know you talk to a lot of people coming through the food bank that you help to run, are you getting a sense that that rise in the minimum wage is helping or is the fact that benefits are lagging prices by so much really the fundamental aspect of life for a lot of the people using your food bank? I think we, last month, we fed 12,500 12 people through our food bank. I think people are getting very disheartened with the increase in food prices. I think even from donations to food banks, people used to be able to go shopping, buy some value items, be able to put them in the baskets on the end to give to charities. Now a lot of the prices of this food are just out of people's price range. They just can't 
can't afford to do it. Pasta was 17 pence before COVID. Now it's 79 pence. That's a huge increase in a basic food that is a kind of become a staple for diet people. They're not particularly healthy, not a great meal. I think we get things like chickens, potatoes, good good quality stuff that people can make proper meals. People won't take a chicken because it takes too long to cook it in a cooker now, and that's just too much money. They won't take potatoes because they take too long to cook. People want ready meals, quick and easy food, that are not healthy, so that's going to have a long-term effect on the NHS, and they'll all end up looking overweight like me. It will be, be a big problem. So we just, I think we're putting ourselves in such a downward spiral. It's, it's painful for the voluntary sector, other, you know, other industries. We're we're under pressure. Twelve and a half thousand people a month. Mm. That's that's a lot of people to feed. Yeah. Jasmine, you and I have talked about this a lot in recent months. Mm. I'd say both of us were onto this inflation surge pretty early. The first ever on the money we did back in September. Inflation mm. is back. I still am not completely convinced that the Chancellor gets it. <laughs> No. Sorry, I'm just not. No. I don't think he really understands the extent of this cost of living crisis. Yeah. If he did, he wouldn't have given the kind of speech he did to the CBI last night, talking about changes in in months' mm -hmm. time, even you know, waiting till after the summer, waiting till the autumn, yeah. as Helen Barnard said. Well, exactly, and we we spoke about this with the, the spring budget and the Queen's speech. In in neither of them were we given any really concrete ideas that, that uh, of help, because and both times there were does a bloke know anyone in real life <laughs> you do wonder you know public you? school yeah. oxford mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. politics investment mm -hmm. banks does he really get it multi-millionaire i know it doesn't help does it because I, i've got neighbors i've got one who's who's a um single parent she says it costs her now a week's wages she works part-time week's wages to pay her gas and electricity bill um there's another one who's a, a teacher it costs her a day's wages to fill up her pet her car with petrol so when you are at that stage you know it, it's real it is real and as neil has said again you know the 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 price of the basics in food have gone up way more than 9% so we need to i think really look at, at as we're doing now how this is affecting the people at the bottom end mm. and what can be done as has been said right now not not at the end of the of the year we will carry on this discussion of course in future episodes of on the money Pretty much no more important aspect of UK public policy making, to my mind, now um, than this. Neil Sharlick of Gilliam Street Angels, Helen Barnard of Joseph Roundtree Foundation. Always a pleasure to have you on the show. Please come back again soon. Jasmine Bertels, MissMoneyMagMike.com is staying with us for the show. This is On the Money with me, Liam Halligan. After the break. We'll meet the lad from Merseyside who, with the help of the Guide Dogs for the Blind Association, has developed the confidence to pursue his football dreams. And he's pretty good. Stay with us. You're on the money. Every Every
free on GB News TV, DAB Plus Digital Radio and online. Now, here at On The Money, we pride ourselves on covering a range of business stories, which affect a wide variety of people. That's why when we heard that two-thirds of kids with visual impairment are worried their disability will hold them back from reaching their dreams, we thought it was an important on-the-money story. Hey, I'm delighted and privileged to be joined by Kerry Bevan. She is from the Guide Dogs for the Blind Association, the charity that we all collected tin for for when we were kids, also leading this new research into how people with blindness and visual impairment can pursue their career dreams. We also have in the studio 19-year-old Rainbow Bwangi from Liverpool. By the age of nine, Rainbow had lost his sight, unfortunately, in both eyes, but that's not held him back. It was thanks to support from Guide Dogs for the Blind that he developed the confidence to pursue his dreams of becoming a sportsman. And Rainbow represents his country on the British Blind football team. Here to tell us more, it's Kerry Bevan and Rainbow Bwangi. Rainbow, it's a real privilege to meet you Hi. here in the On The Money studio. Now, I've watched blind football. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, just to explain to viewers and listeners who haven't come across the concept of blind football, it's played on a court with boards at the side, so you don't need to do throw-ins. The ball stays in play. But the ball itself, it has kind of bells in it, pieces of metal, doesn't it? So you can hear the ball and play by touch and hearing and feel. Just describe to us what it's like playing blind football. Yeah, so but the key difference is with blind football is uh, there's like little metal ball bearings inside the ball. So when the ball's rolling, it just makes um, like a rattle noise. Um, and then there's, there's three um, key areas around the pitch. So you have your defence area, which the goalkeeper can see. Um, so they um, guide the defenders. You have the midfield area where the manager and the coaches stand and they can guide the midfielders. And then you have the attacking area. So this is the main difference. So you have um, an audio cue behind the goal. So you have someone standing behind the goal to give you an audio cue on where the goal is. So it could be left, right, forward, back. I'm here, the goal's here. Amazing. And it's just letting you know where the goal is. But yeah, um, it's, it's really enjoyable and it's, it's um, really physical game, but it's really fast and um, intense. And the standard is extremely high. I, I urge on the money viewers and listeners, to, to check it out on, online, to go and watch blind football. As I, as I say, I've, I've watched some of it myself in the, in the past. Um, and everyone has, all the outfield players, they have to wear a blindfold, don't they? So everybody's got the same completely limited vision, given that you various people will have different varying degrees of blindness. Though blind, uh, keepers can have some vision, can't they? Yeah, so the keepers are fully sighted. Um, so usually the keepers are futsal keepers. So any futsal keepers out there, come enjoy them blind football. <laughs> um, always, always looking for some. But no, um, but yeah, we usually um, take, take B1 um, footballers. Um, if it's internationally, if it's nationally, then it's B2, B3. So the categories usually go from B1 to B5. So that's like the sight classification on how much a person can see. So B1 is no sight, B5 is quite a lot of sight. Um, and that, that's the way the site classification works within uh, the realms of blind football. But, yeah, it's, it's definitely great just to go and have a look, um, just to have a little sneak peek on, on what blind football is. To be fair, you've got me in at a good time at the moment. Um, <laughs> I'm going to Italy in two weeks' time to the Euros. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to be playing for England in two weeks. So, yeah, you can catch that on, on YouTube. And, you, and you've met some pretty... Pretty world-class footballers yourself, as well as being an international yourself. You've met Marcus Rashford, you've met Jesse Lingard. But these United players, I thought you should be a Liverpool fan. You're from Merseyside, no, what's going on? I, I, I was born in Manchester, oh, so I've already, I've already said that. But yeah, no, um, when I was younger, when I first became blind and obviously getting my confidence up, um, starting to play blind football, obviously it was Rashford who I looked up to and um, yeah, it was obviously guide dogs who gave me the opportunity to meet Rashford and then obviously since then I've went on to play for England and since then um, he sent me like messages over the internet about like good luck and everything so yeah it's just been a good confidence boost but also a great awareness thing to for people to go and have a look on the video and to see about what blind football is. Kerry let's I mean we're obviously in the presence of an amazing young man he'd achieve whatever he wants to do in life clearly but tell us how the research that you've been doing at Guys Dogs for the Blind has, has highlighted what people with blindness and visual impairment 
can do? What would you say to people who are blind or visually impaired, listening to this, uh, their friends and family? What would you say to them to encourage them to pursue their dreams in the way that this young man so successfully has? Yeah, Rainbow is an absolutely brilliant advocate for um, following your ambitions. You know, anybody who's got aspirations shouldn't be held back by any form of disability. Um, and Guide Dogs for the Blind um, actually aren't always known for their children and young people services, but we are the largest provider for services for children with visual impairment um, in the UK. Um, so we've got a whole range of services from basically point of diagnosis, which could be very, very young, um, supporting all the way through the adult journey. Um, and then that's where our Guide Dog service would come in. So I think... When we're looking at um, the, the research that we want to use to develop our services further to meet those needs, some of those stats are quite stark. 69% of children um, so with a visual impairment said that they felt they would be held back by their yes. disability. 75% of adults living with a via, uh, visual impairment um, will not be in full-time employment. Um, so that's a huge issue that we want to seek to address. Tell us some of the... I mean, for many people, with all respect, Rainbow, who, who aren't familiar with blind football, they'll think, what? You can play football, really? But you can, I've seen it, it's an amazing game. Tell us about some of the other things that you've seen blind and visually impaired people doing, uh, Kerry, that ordinarily you'd think, no, nah, that can't be done. I, I, I think the sky's the limit for everybody. Um, we've got so many people who are guide dog owners and they're going off trekking, they're going off um, doing really influential roles, you know, influencing government decisions, policy makers. Um, there, sh there is no reason why any job should not be limiting for anybody with visual impairment or sight loss. And so Are employers always that way inclined? Uh, do you have to do some advocacy with employers? Absolutely. I think it's about the accessibility rights and making sure that people are equipped with the right um, equipment, that their needs are assessed so that they can you know, be given the tools to, to fulfil their potential. Um, and, and actually, that's, again, some of the stats that come out is that the, the perception of the workplace is that there aren't the right tools in place to support people, and that's a barrier for, for young people particularly when considering their future career options. So much more needs to be done around raising the awareness of what is out there to support people um, in, in their roles um, and that employers have a responsibility to make sure that they are inclusive of, of everybody. I think, you know, what stood out to me in the research that we did was eight in ten children said that there weren't enough role models with a visual impairment mm. for them to look up to. And Step forward, and Rainbow Bawangi. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He's ticked that box massively. Rain, Rain, Rainbow, let me ask you, as we, as we finish the interview, you know, you, you're clearly a very physically talented guy. You've got a great personality. You're a great-looking guy. You must have had bags of confidence and then you were hit with this blindness in your youth. Tell us just briefly what that did to you and how you managed to climb out of that depression. I think it's just I've always seen things as things happen for a reason and I wouldn't be sat here now if things weren't happening for a reason. So when I first became blind at the age of eight, it was a scary experience. Mm. But then with the help of everyone around me, I kind of just stayed positive and then that's when I thought, right, I, want, I love sports, I want to be in the Paralympics. And that was when I started doing numerous sports but then obviously my focus was on blind football and now obviously I'm playing for my country hopefully going to Paris 24 and many others in the in the country and like I suppose it's just I always stick with my motto and I always tell everybody this is I haven't got a disability I just have a different ability and it's just sticking with that motto within your day-to-day day -day life whether it's sports or whether it's your, your living skills you know what I mean it's just a different ability and that's what people need to look at within society of just changing that stigma of blind people, or even dis disabled people can't do anything. It's just looking at it a different ability way. Wow. Well, Kerry Bevan of the Guide, Guide Dogs for the Blind Association and Rainbow Bawangi, world-class footballer for England. I've done many interviews in my time, but I'll certainly remember this one for the rest of my life. Thank you so much. No, thank Good you. luck. Thank you. This is On The Money with me, Liam Halligan. After the break, we discuss car ownership. Is it over? Today's Money Talks guest seems to think so. Tim Betters is Managing Director at car rental company Sixth UK. And he'll be telling motorists who are... He'll be telling us how motorists are trying to save money. All that's off the GB News headlines with Rhiannon Jones. Thank you, Liam. It's 1.33, your top stories from the GB newsroom. 
Boris Johnson's been told that he faces no further action and won't receive a second fine for breaching COVID laws, number 10 has confirmed. The Met Police has now concluded its investigation into breaches of regulations at Downing Street and Whitehall at a cost of £460,000. In total, 126 referrals have been made for fixed penalty notices for breaches of lockdown rules during the pandemic. The Chancellor is under mounting pressure from businesses, charities and MPs to produce a package of support after inflation hit a 40-year high. There are calls for a windfall tax on oil and gas companies that have benefited from high global prices. Rishi Sunak said in a speech last night that the government's prepared to help families cope with rising inflation. The United Nations is warning that Russia's invasion of Ukraine could soon cause a global food crisis that may last for years. The UN Secretary General says the situation could lead to tens of millions of people facing food insecurity and famine. Russia and Ukraine account for nearly a third of global wheat supplies. The wars led to soaring global prices. And the UK's biggest ever lottery winners have just been revealed. Joe and Jess Thwaite won a record-breaking £184 million jackpot on a lucky dip ticket. The Gloucester couple, who've been married for 11 years, say they now have time to dream. TV Online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News for gold and silver investment. Here's a quick snapshot of today's markets. The pound is 1.243 to the dollar. The pound is 1.18 to the euro. And the price of gold currently stands at £1,472.71 per ounce. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News for real-time investment. Every morning from 6 o'clock, we'll wake you up with GB News Breakfast with all the stories you didn't know from the night before. So whether it's serious news, entertainment or your own views from all over our great nation, we're here to kick off your day with a smile. And the national media should be reflecting and reporting what's happening here. You will notice the Northwestern accents. <laughs> Whether you're with us on TV, radio or online, every morning, it's breakfast from 6am. Hope you can join us. On radio, they call it the drive time slot. 4pm until 6pm as listeners head home. It's that part of the schedule when the dust of the day's events begin to clarify and we try to make sense of it for you. Brazier is drive time for radio and TV. It's fast, it's punchy, it's opinionated, there's a brazier angle and a little bit of levity. That's the question. That's two questions, actually. <laughs> That's brazier, Monday to Thursday, 4 till 6, on GB News. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery and you can join me every weekday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. Me and my panel will get stuck right into the day's events. And I can tell you, in fact, I can warn you, expect some robust debates some strong opinions and perspectives from both sides of the fence. It's about you at home as well. I love to read out all of your comments, or at least as many as I can. So join me, Michelle Jubery, Monday to Friday, 6 till 7, on Jubes and Kerr. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. And welcome back. You're on the money. The Queen's speech, read this year by Prince Charles, of course, set out plans for a renters' reform bill, which aims to make life easier for the 4 million-plus households who privately rent in England. The reform will start with the abolition of Section 21 of the 1988 Housing Act, which allows private landlords to evict tenants with no reason, as long as they give eight weeks' notice. 
The housing charity Shelter said some 200,000 private renters were served with notice of a so-called no-fault eviction when rumours of scrapping it were announced last time in 2019. But with spiralling rental costs and more people than ever finding themselves on the streets in the UK, will the government's reform go further? Well, welcome back to Ben Beadle. He's the chief executive of the National Residential Landlords Association, who's backing the abolition of Section 21. And Jasmine Bertle is still with us, our regular moneymugpie.com guest here on The Money. Ben, good to have you back in the studio. Just explain what 20, Section 21 does and what happens if it isn't there anymore. Yeah, so effectively, Section 21 allows landlords to get possession of their property uh, almost as a, uh, an administrative exercise, if you will, um, and, let, and tenants move out at the end of that period. Now, what's being proposed is that that is uh, abolished, uh, but we want to see a new framework that gives landlords clear and comprehensive grounds for repossession for legitimate reasons. We will have, watching this show and listening to this show, both people renting, yep. and we'll also have people who are landlords. Now, sometimes landlords are big international organisations. Other times, they're an ordinary couple with one rental property because yep. they haven't got a pension. If you have a contract with a tenant to give, say, six months' notice, right, which is quite standard, under Section 21, can you use that to ask them to leave after two months? So if you've got a fixed-term contract, then you would serve a Section 21 notice to bring that tenancy agreement to an end at the end of the So that term. overrides the, the contract? But also, if you've got a periodic contract, which just runs and runs at the end of the fixed term, you can then end it with two months' notice. And I okay. think what we've seen, Liam, is the private rented sector expand significantly in the past 10 years, yeah. as you've written about. Yeah. Um, uh, and what we're seeing is the PRS housing a lot more people... Private rental sector. Well, then, it, yes, the private rented sector, housing many more people than it was intended to. And so the argument is one of security. You know, if you've got families with kids, if you've got yeah. um, uh, older renters in there, do they want to be bothered if, uh, to move if, if landlords are giving these notices? But the point I'm keen to get across is that actually 92% of tenancies are ended by tenants themselves. Not a lot of people talk about that yeah. in the context of Section 21. Yeah. And so we are talking about a small minority of cases. But as you rightly observe, you know, landlords are... 94% of them are individuals, and typically half of them have one or two properties, mm. right? They're doing it for investment reasons, pension reasons, etc. If you're not going to be able to get possession of your property for serious arrears, for antisocial behaviour, for wanting to well, sell might, the property. You might want to sell it. You might want to move it, it, back it, in. Indeed. And, and I think, you know, this is the debate that we need to have now. Mm. It's all well and good to call for the abolition of Section 21, but it's a really curious business model, isn't it? You know, that the, the first thing you think about is booting out your tenant. And actually, that couldn't be further from the truth as a landlord. You only really want to ask a tenant to move on if you've got a genuine reason to do so. And so what we're asking for is a proper debate within the white paper that's due to publish, uh, be published in the next few weeks that articulates this. And the Queen's speech actually set out a commitment to protect landlords against serious rent arrears and persistent rent arrears, but also antisocial behaviour, because that's so, so important. But it's not, as, as Liam says, it's not just that. There are times when you might want to sell the place or you might want to move back in or you might want your, your ch kids to move into Indeed. it. You know, there are all sorts of perfectly legitimate but n nothing to do with bad behaviour kind no, of things. No, no, indeed. So, I, I mean, what, what concerns me is that this will put off a lot of the, the ones you've mentioned, mm. Liam, you know, just ordinary people who happen to have a place or maybe, that <clears throat> you know, they've got two or three properties... And you know, if they get if they get rid of their properties, then it's it's likely to be the big boys, like you know, people like Lloyd's that seem to want to be in the big institutional landlords. Yes, yes right. which we wouldn't want. Well, I, I, I mean, at the moment we have a supply crisis, right? We've spoken about this before, mm. and I think the the uncertainty around some of this is is not helpful. Mm. For the first time in uh, many many years, the private rented sector is actually contracting. And I think we have a lot of uncertainty mm. about, you know, what, for those very reasons, if you've got a property that's become available and you choose to let it, that's helping, mm. right? Uh, but if you need it back or the environment isn't conducive to you renting it, then, you know, we reduce the supply of properties, rents increase, we've mm. got cost of living uh, uh, issues at mm. the moment. It's a perfect storm of all of those things coming together. Mm. And so what we want to see is a proper debate about supply. We want to see home uh, house supply increase, not just in the PRS, but also in social housing as well. Mm. But we also want to make sure that the environment for operating in, 
when Section 21 goes, is a fair one for landlords. Mm. Now, now, Lloyds, who aren't here to defend themselves, other big institutional landlords, they would say they provide a decent service, and, and in some cases they do. In many cases yes, they absolutely. do. absolutely. But, of course, you know, for every email as a journalist I get from um, uh, a landlord saying, oh, I've got huge rent arrears and I can't get the tenants out, I just want to you know, live in the house, it's yeah. my house... Um, I also, of course, get one, two, three, four emails from tenants who feel they've been um, uh, treated unfairly, the landlord isn't giving them their deposit back. There are lots of rogue mm. landlords, aren't there? Mm. But there are also lots of very decent people who just have a single investment property. How's the government going to strike this balance? I'm still not clear, if I'm honest, Ben. You, you've explained it as well as you can. Maybe we just don't know. <laughs> mm. If you have a contract with a tenant with, say, and the contract has two months' notice in it, mm. and your tenant has signed that, and you've signed that, and the contract is still, you know, in date. Yep. It's a current contract. How's what, that going to work? How's that going to work? Yeah, I think Do you that... need Section 1 to make that contract, Section 21, to make that contract stick? Because if you do and then Section 21 goes, does any contract mean anything? <laughs> yes, well, quite. quite. Yeah. I think the, the issue for government that they need to resolve, and they will do that in fairness through the white paper... Uh, is whether or not some of the Which is like is, preliminary... Yeah, legis- before we get into a bill, you, before yeah, we get to an act. Yeah. So I think we're still a good few um, months away from sort of legislation on this, but we will see the white paper in a few weeks, and no doubt we'll be talking about it in a few weeks. But what they need to articulate is, firstly, whether this sort of stuff is going to be retrospective or whether it applies to... Ten- yeah, new to current contracts, anyway. are they nixed by this? Exactly yeah, yeah. right. And, you know, uh, our, from our viewpoint, we, we see it working far, far better for new tenancies only. But we also need to make sure that the replacement framework is effective. And, you know, it's all well and good to hark on about notices and Section 21 going, but what does this revised framework look like? Because, you know, as we've discussed, landlords will have legitimate reasons Mm -hmm. for asking a tenant to move on. And frankly, if I'm living next to somebody where there is antisocial behaviour, I'm going to expect that landlord Mm -hmm. to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Um, And these are the very, very fine balancing act Mm -hmm. that the government is going to have to resolve. Mm -hmm. And it strikes me, I mean, thinking back to the 70s and the 80s, unless, you know, it does become economically more realistic for people to rent, you know, vulnerable families, low-income families, people who just want to rent because they're moving around the country, Mm -hmm. pursuing Mm -hmm. their career, pursuing their Mm -hmm. dreams... Mm -hmm young people and so on, uh, unless it does become more more viable, we could be in the world of rent controls. <laughs> well, and yeah. once you're in the world of rent controls, it mm. strikes me, I think most historic evidence suggests it's like a populist move, we're just going to cap rents, then private rental properties will just be removed from the market, mm. right? Well, I mean, it doesn't work. You know, we've seen it in Berlin, we've seen it. It brings many other problems than it, than it, than it solves. And I think, you know, the best way at the end of the day to cure concerns around... Uh, um, rents and costs and so forth is to address the the root cause, which is the supply mm-hmm. of, of property, both in the social and uh, private rented sector. But you spoke about the build to rent sector. Government is clearly favouring this industry. But if every property was built that's in the pipeline, that would only equate to 4% of the overall number of houses. So we need more mm-hmm. and we need the framework to work fairly for both landlords and tenants. And, and we do need to have, as you say, that framework, something that will protect tenants uh, that I've heard, or I'm sure you have, um, yeah. where their landlord is, is on the other side of the world, There's, they've got a leaking roof, they've got mould, you know, nothing's being done. And, and, and I do think that... There, seem, there need to be more protections, more, more help for tenants in that situation. I, I, I agree. We've got to leave it there, guys, mm. I'm afraid. Lots of contesting issues here, lots of competing mm. interests. In my experience, the vast majority of tenants and the vast majority of landlords are decent mm. people. Mm. It's a shame that people on both sides ruin this situation. Mm. Ben Beadle of the National Land- Residential Landlords Association, great to see you. And Jasmine, as ever, MissMoneyMagpie.com. <laughs> Time now... For my daily interview series, Money Talks. Did you know that the annual cost of running a car rose by £3,556 in the last year? Well, that's according to research by the rental company Sixth UK. The same research suggests nearly three quarters of UK car owners think owning a car has become a financial burden. And a third of 18 to 24 year olds are, the research suggests, considering giving up their vehicle altogether. Well, Tim Vetters is the managing director of Sixth UK. He says people are shifting away from car ownership and towards leasing and rentals to save cash as the cost of living squeeze bites. So here he is to tell us more. Tim Vetters, managing director of Sixth UK, my latest guest. 
on Money Talks. Tim, great to have you on the show. A really interesting uh, area of um, consumer affairs here, the death of car ownership. Tell us about it. Yeah, hi, Liam. Thanks for having me. Uh, the death of car ownership, no, that's, that's quite a strong uh, phrase you're picking. <laughs> I, I wouldn't go that far, probably. No. Um, Forgive me, I'm a journalist. <laughs> <laughs> I think what, what the reality is at the moment, and you said it already, um, uh, owning a car becomes more and more expensive. Uh, so many, many people really feel this in their pockets now. And um, what we found out in our studies is that it's very hard for people to actually know how much it costs to own a car. Because there's like a lot of like small things you're not thinking of in the first place. The first thing is, you know, buying a car is always a big investment. Uh, if, even if you buy a mid-sized car nowadays, it will cost you £20,000. So that £20,000 car, just the minute you buy it and you drive off the dealership, it's already worth uh, a couple of thousand less, just leaving the forecourt of your dealers. Um, you will have to find then parking, you have to pay for parking, you have to maintain the car, you have to repair the car, you have to tax the car, you have to get insurance for it, and so on and so on. So it's lots of um, little things which actually make owning a car very expensive. And that for something which you're actually not using uh, uh, very often, it's, it's one of the least utilized assets you will ever buy. We were just talking about housing. Uh, that's where you live, you spend a lot of time there. A car you use an average less than two hours per day, the rest of the day is just sitting around there costing you money. So with that, you know, people, they're starting to see that and think, okay, what's the alternative? I don't want all those costs. I don't want all the hassle. I only want to use a car when I need it. Uh, and if I don't need it, I don't want to know anything about it. So that's really what's driving at the moment is this shift from owning or leasing um, a car to just using it. Tim, one aspect about renting a car, hiring a car, as we say here in the UK, is that you often hire that car from an airport or from somewhere on an industrial estate out of town. It isn't particularly convenient. I'm seeing more and more a trend, maybe you can tell us about it, of delivering rental cars to people so they can use them. I'm also seeing a trend of people using apps to rent out other people's cars who live near to them. It's an interesting set of developments. It is absolutely. And uh, the car rent industry has developed. Uh, so we all know them. You use them when you go on holidays, you arrive in, in Spain, you get a car for a week, and that's pretty much your touch point uh, once per year uh, with car rental. But that's a little bit uh, a thing of the past. Nowadays, uh, car rental is really uh, a mobility provider for everyday usage, also where you live. Um, and therefore, um, you will see that uh, uh, in the case of my company, Six, um, we are actually going a different way. We are not in, in um, commercial estates. We're actually in the city center. Mm -hmm. uh, you will find us in places like uh, Kensington or Shepherd's Bush or uh, Westfield in London or in Piccadilly um, Station in Manchester and so forth mm. and so forth. So we actually we're trying to be where the people are um, uh, in order to, to be accessible. And uh, for people who don't live near one of our locations, we do deliver and collect cars also to home addresses or to office addresses. So we make them available. And this trend of sharing other people's cars, this is exactly you know, part of this movement where we are talking about. They're like, like, why should I own a car which I'm only using for an hour per day or many days even not at all? So why do I not share this with someone else? Uh, so this is part of the, of the uh, yeah, variety of different um, opportunities we have there in order to make mobility happy, happening without owning a car. Uh, so I actually like that. It, 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 it really is a fascinating area. We've covered this a lot on Money Talks over recent months. Surely, in the end, the model, with all respect, isn't what Sixth is doing because you need to lease that expensive real estate in those city centre places that you mentioned in London, in Manchester and elsewhere. In the end, you need to keep and maintain a fleet of cars and that's very, very expensive. You need to pay people to deliver them and then get back to where they've delivered them from and then go there again to pick them up and, and so on. Isn't the end game here 
that we use apps to share each other's cars. After all, if I come out onto my street and many of those cars are on a car-sharing app, I can then pick anything I need from a lorry uh, to, a, to a family saloon to a flashy sports number if I'm going to a posh wedding at the weekend. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, the renting cars out is our business. And yes, we have our overhead costs uh, to pay for those locations. Now, the trick for us is we do utilize those cars. Now, they're not yeah. stood around. What we are trying is to keep them on the road all the time, which means you need less cars on the road for more people to use. And with that, we can we can actually achieve um, uh, still a, uh, yeah, that people can be mobile without, you know, spending over the odds. Um, and then to your app, yes, um, that's absolutely um, a trend. Uh, I agree with you. We do have an app as well where we also um, offer different modes of transport. So we're not limiting ourselves anymore to just renting a car for a day or for a week. Uh, so if you go on a sixth app, for example, you will be able to, uh, to do ride hailing there. So you, you call um, in London, for example, you, you will get an Edison Lee uh, a car. Um, you can rent out those e-scooters, which are everywhere at the moment and, and giving me a headache when I'm driving myself. Um, you can <laughs> rent bicycles or you can subscribe cars. Um, so there's uh, different modes within our app. And our idea is basically to give a platform to customers. So they can choose whatever mode they need and want at this moment in time. And sometimes you're just okay with, with you know, a local car, which brings yeah. you from A to B. But sometimes, you know, you want to impress your girlfriend and you want to have a nice fancy car. So then you rent. Uh, that's okay. Uh, it needs to be a mix of different um, uh, modes. And only if that is available to yeah. customers, uh, it's easy, convenient, Tim then Vettes. they will walk away from owning a car. Tim Vetters, I found a very interesting interview. Managing Director of the car rental company, Six. UK. Thanks so much for appearing here on The Money as my latest Money Talks guest. That is all we've got time for today. Stay tuned. As up next, it's Alex Phillips with We Need to Talk About, and she's here in the studio. Alex, tell me, tell me, tell me. Uh, which is Rishi Sunak said there's not much you can do about it. Bank of England governor said the same. The cost of living crisis and crazy inflation. How did we get into this mess and can anything be done? We're also going to be talking about the fact that over 70% of us are going to be obese by 2040. Should the government be tackling that? And NASA are launching a new rocket to the International Space Station tonight. Any reason to be excited? Well, I'm going to be asking a space expert. All of that and a lot more. That's Alex Phillips after the break with We Need to Talk About. Stay with us for that and join me tomorrow at 1pm here on The Money. I'll be focusing once again on the cost of living crisis and helping you beat the squeeze. Thanks to all my fabulous guests today. Thanks to you for joining me on GB News, TV, DAB Plus, Digital Radio and online. This is GB News. I'm Liam Halligan and that was On The Money. Hello again, I'm Aidan McGiven from the Met Office. Following the very lively thunderstorms that affected parts of South and South East England last night, most places are dry today. Sunny spells, still a few showers around, mainly towards the northwest, closer to this area of low pressure. But the storms have now moved through. A legacy of cloudier skies across central and eastern England for a time, perhaps even the odd light shower. But even these will tend to fade away. The cloud will break up. Sunny spells coming through. The best of the sunshine, eastern and southern Scotland, northern England, Wales and the southwest by the afternoon. And although we're not going to reach the dizzy heights that we saw earlier in the week, temperatures are going to reach the high teens, low 20s in most places. Nevertheless, a bit breezier and cloudier for western Scotland.